So I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup on some radical stuff. So some cleanup. Uh, can you see my thing? You're not sharing your screen. Oh, uh, OK. Oh, where am I sharing it? Oh, OK, let's see. <laughs> I was like, am I in another meeting just like? <laughs> <laughs> like a quick question. I'm at, I'm at the college meeting, you know, like Linda's giving a meeting, and I'm just like, <laughs> Linda's the dean, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. I have a quick uh, question, actually. I, yeah. I've already twice now missed things that you've like put in Microsoft Teams, so I apologize if you already did. But is there like some literature you recommend? I know, like I look at like Vakil. Yeah, so. Team McDonald. So we're in a That's Team right. McDonald chapter one. Right. And um, the Dumb and Foot uh, chapter. So so where are we? Right. Yeah. I know the, the references from the homework. They, they pretty much cover most of this. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. The references from the homework are pretty much it. Right. So where are we? So we're doing a T.M. McDonald chapter one and then Dumb and Foot uh, chapter 15, but only parts. Um, and then um and then we're moving into um let me see what we're moving into so we're moving into into um uh so dominant foot 10.2 uh, 10.3 10 and then there's a big chapter and then chapter 12. Uh, and then chapter 12. OK, so that's where we are um, as far as things go. So uh, all right, Th hopefully that that helps. Um, OK, so um, now are there any other questions? OK, so let me just do some cleanup on the radical stuff. So some cleanup. On radicals. Okay, and then we're going to move into modules over PIDs after this. But the idea is that uh, so 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 one thing that I had to say is I, I issued the correction. So keep an eye out for corrections after after the class. I'll I'll do this. But um, so uh, so in the ring. C of X, Y, right, uh, which is a UFD. Taylor, just so I'm clear, when we say you're, we're cleaning up radicals, they were cleaning up how we talked about radical ideals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some things that I had to cover, right? So I'm okay. just mean, I just mean like stuff about radical ideals that I didn't completely cover last time that I just we have to just do some finishing touches on it and then we're going to leave that area until we come back to primary decomposition right so so we're going to stop that for a little bit then we're going to do yeah then we're going to do some modules over pids and then we're going to do primary decompositions or then then we're going to do primary decomposition okay. um yeah maybe primary decomposition might be even later uh because i need to do some more stuff about like the eisenstein irreducibility and things like this so okay okay so in the ring this thing so there, there's two statements so um so the ideals the ideals um x and y squared are not co-prime as ideals right so um here you have this ideal plus this ideal. So remember, we define them to be co-prime if they generated the whole thing. OK, so they're co-prime if. Uh, so this this is equal to if you add them together. So this is not the whole ring. OK, and in particular, you can see that they this this thing here. This ideal, the picture of this is like 
Okay, so it's kind of like some thickened version of the the. So it's it's like the it's a thickened point at the origin. Okay, but on the other hand, the elements x squared and y squared. I'm oh, sorry, x and y squared are co-prime as elements. So just something to be um, aware of, okay? So I, I made a mistake um, and uh, I said that they were co-prime and they're not, okay? All right, so now I need to do an IOU. So there was this statement that I said about the inverse image of the nil radical, right, being the radical of an ideal. All right, so this is a IOU theorem. And this is what we said last time that was relatively straightforward, and I just want to give you the details, right? So uh, let A be a ring. What the heck happened? Did I make a new page? Yeah, oh. you went to a new page. Okay, so let A be a ring. Okay, and let I be an ideal in A. Okay, and let, um, and this, what we're going to do is we're going to let Q be the quotient map. So this is the ring homomorphism from A to A mod I, the quotient map. Okay, and so uh, what I said was is that Q inverse of the radical, the nil radical of A mod I is equal to the radical of I, right? We also have this other formula that, okay, so there's this thing where you take, these are ideals in the quotient, um, and so this is also equal to zero of A mod I, okay. So do you guys understand this notation that I'm using with the subscript A mod I? So, so here I'm using the notation. Um, you know, uh, A1, AR, B is the ideal generated by a1 through AR in the ring B. You know, and so, so uh, most of the time we don't need to specify. We omit B, right? But I'm just writing the B here so that you know which ring it's in. So like, so this is the zero ideal in A mod I, not the zero ideal in A. That's the only reason I'm writing that it this way. Okay, so let's do the proof of this. All right, so consider the map. Uh, the map uh, phi from A to A mod I. A mod radical I. Okay, so uh, since the, radi ra the radical of I contains I, so it's some sort of making it bigger, so the we have a factorization. So sometimes this is called the universal property of the quotient, right? And it's that this map here, we can first map to A mod I, and then we can map to A mod the radical of I, like so. So we have phi, we have phi bar here, and we have q here. Okay, so so what I'm saying is that this map phi factors through the canonical quotient a mod i, and you get phi bar like this. Okay, so um, uh, so what does that tell us? So this tells us that the kernel. Okay, so now we can describe the kernel here. This means. 
Well, the kernel of phi bar. Well, this is the set of A bar in A mod I, uh, such that A to the N is an element of I. So that's what it means to be in the radical, right? A to the N needs to be an I for some N. Okay, so N's a natural number. This is also equal to the no potent elements. of a mod i okay and this is the nil radical right so the nil radical is the radical of zero of a mod i so the other thing is is that this kernel here of this map here right this has another description so this is the quotient of the the, the big ideal by the small ideal right so this proves the result Right, so this this proves the result. Um, you know, this thing, one of the results. Right, and so taking the inverse image of this formula gives exactly what you want. So, okay, so that proves one of them, and then let me just do the second part, right? The second part comes from taking the inverse image of the formula. All right, I don't think I'm totally understanding this last bit. I understood everything, but I don't, under, I don't think I know what that means. Uh, well, let me let me say. Uh, so I'm just gonna write it here. This part, you mean this taking the inverse image thing? So if you do inverse of the radical i mod i, so this is the radical of i. So this is the ideal in A, which is the inverse image of this ideal. So this is this post-set isomorphism or lattice isomorphism theorem that says okay. that the ideals of this, the ideals of A mod i, are the ideals of A which contain I, and the bijection is given by taking Q inverse, right? Uh, and so this is Q inverse of the radical, okay? So it says that the, the nil radical of the quotient, the inverse image of the nil radical of the quotient is the radical of the ideal. So, so these are the two formulas. We had this formula, and then we had this formula that we wanted to prove. Right, this uh, you can't see my pointing. I don't. Can you see my pointing? No. Okay. So uh, yeah. So this one and this one. Does that make sense now, Colin? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this isn't the only way to do this. Another way of doing this would be like, um, uh, you know, you could start with an element, and you know, you show that the two things are subsets of each other. Right, and then you just kind of like walk through the definitions of what it means to be nilpotent, and that's kind of like another way that you could start doing a proof like this, right? You could work element-wise. Um, okay, so let me give a definition. Um, so, so a nilpotent thickening. This won't be in the books, I think. Uh, is a ring homomorphism phi from B prime to B, uh, which is surjective and um, and whose kernel only contains no potent elements. So it's like you're taking a quotient, but the only thing you kill is no potent elements, okay? So no potent elements, you should think of as like nothing, right? They're like almost nothing, right? They're, 
just elements, they're almost zero, right? And so you're like killing things that are like almost zero, right? Okay, so um, so another way to do this is that the, the, so the corollary here of the result here is that the map uh, phi bar from a mod i to a mod the radical of i is a nilpotent thickening. All right, so the proof here, it's actually like the, you know, this thing here is sometimes called, so this thing is actually killing the, the nilpotents. So the proof is, is that the kernel of phi bar, well, this is I mod I. So uh, this is uh, what we have by the, the post-set isomorphism theorem or the lattice isomorphism theorem. And this is the result that we, what we just proved. And this is the zero A mod I. And this is all the nilpotent elements. Of uh, A mod I. Okay. So that's what we have here. Okay. So one last thing that I want to do, which is an exercise that, that you guys have already seen, okay? So you've seen the, this Atiyah McDonald exercise. So recall, and I, and I just want to say something about, about this. So, uh, so here was an Atiyah McDonald exercise, or one part of an exercise. And I mentioned this yesterday, but I, and I forgot that I had actually assigned this to you guys, right? Is, okay, so let I and J be ideals in a ring A, right? And so the statement that I made was, is that there's like two ways to do, uh, you, you, could, you, could, you could try and, um, okay, so here, I'm just gonna say it. I, J, and I intersect J. So th these two things are kind of very similar. So I, J, remember, is just all the linear combinations of something in I times something in J. So it looks like, you know, all those linear combinations. And this is the thing that are in both ideals, okay? And so the statement that I had was that this, these two things have the same radical, right? So the, the, the things are, these, these two rings are very similar. One is kind of like the other, but with no potents, okay? Not the ideals, but the quotient rings. Okay. So, yeah, it's kind of weird is because is sometimes when I use words, the adjectives correspond to quotient rings and sometimes they correspond to ideals. And this is something that we need to get used to. Um, all right. So let, let me do the proof of this. But you guys have probably already seen. Okay, so one thing, one way is easy. I, J is a subset of I intersect J, right? So this uses the ideal property. So this thing is clearly in the I times J, this is clearly an I because I is closed under multiplication. It's also closed in J because J is closed under multiplication. And because it's an I and because it's in J, it's an I intersect J, right? And so this thing we have, and this implies that the radical of I, J is contained in the radical of I intersect J. So that's one direction, which is easy. The other direction is, is also not so bad, but it involves a trick, right? And this isn't the only way to do it, I think, but uh, conversely, we suppose that A is an I intersect J. Okay, so who did this? So if anyone did the exercise, you know, um, you might know how to do this. Does anyone have any suggestions of what should, I should do next? Okay, well, what I do is um, we, we take A squared, right? Then A squared is an element of IJ, correct? Right, A is an element of I and A is an element of J. 
So A times A is an element of IJ, right? Hence, right, this shows that I intersect J is contained in the radical of IJ. Because the radical is all anything to a power that's in IJ is in the radical. That's the definition of the radical. Okay, so this means uh, uh, so this means A is an IJ, and hence we have this. Okay, and this gives us the following. Us, well, we have uh, the radical of I intersect J is equal to the radical of the radical of ij but the radical of the radical is just the thing that's another exercise the radical of the radical is just the radical it's like a closure it's a closure it's what we call a closure operation if you do it twice you don't get anything new okay so that's what we have and that proves the result that proves that these two things are equal to each other okay so how different are the ideals i times j and i intersect j right that's a good question right so how different do you think these things are they can't be that different because they have the same radical right and the radical is kind of like the core information about the ideal right it's got the most of the stuff the only thing that it's missing is infinitesimal information about the quotient so the quotient of a mod ij the a mod of an ideal and a mod, the radical of the ideal, those two rings are essentially the same, except for one of them has extra nilpotent elements, right? Okay, so um, the, the, the corollary here is that a, so what do we have? So a mod ij, Uh, is a nilpotent thickening of A mod I intersect J. Okay, so this thing is 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 like this one, but it contains more information. It, it contains more things. So, like here's an example. Right, the, the example that, that I was talking about. So A is like C of X, Y. Uh, I will be X, and this will be, and J will be X. Right? A mod IJ. So this is C of X, Y mod X squared, and A mod. I intersect J is C of X, Y mod X, and this is C of Y. So the only thing that this ring here, the, the lower ring does, has that the other ring doesn't is this element X where X squared is equal to zero, right? So it has this extra like no potent dude, okay? So let's do the proof of the corollary. Okay, so these two rings are very, so the, this is how you should think. These two rings are super, super similar. This is like the, this is like a, this, this one corresponds to a line, the bottom one. And this is a line with a little thickness in the other direction, okay? So the proof of the corollary, right? So there is a ring homomorphism A mod IJ to A mod I intersect J. That's because one ideal is contained in the other, right? We can always do that. And the kernel, and the kernel contains nilpotent elements, right? So, but how do I show that the kernel contains only nilpotent elements? Okay, so we have this thing. Uh, so we want to show the kernel we want to show uh, to have only no potent elements. Okay, and here's what we're gonna do. 
A mod IJ. This is, let's call this psi. This psi goes to A mod I intersect J. And now this thing goes to A mod I intersect J. And let's take the radical. Well, the radicals are the same. So this is the radical of IJ, right? These two things are the same because the radical ideals are the same. Okay, this map here, Okay, let's call this map phi. Okay, so the kernel of phi, so the first fact is the kernel of phi contains the kernel of psi. If it goes to zero under the first map, right, then it will go to zero under the second map, and hence it will be in, containing the kernel there. The second thing is that the kernel of phi is equal to the no potent elements. Of, um, uh, of, uh, no potent elements of this ring. Okay. And that's it. Okay, maybe I can do one more thing. Um, uh, okay, so that, that proves the result. Okay, so it, this is all the no potent elements and the kernels contained in there. Okay, one last piece of terminology. So for a ring A, uh, for a ring, not a little a, We sometimes uh, call um, we we use we use the um, so a red is a mod this ideal okay so the, uh, the call uh, uh, well we we okay so okay let me just do it like this red not red. R, R E D reduction. Oh, okay, right, right. The reduction. Or redu reduction or or reduced uh, form of A. So um, yeah, so this is called the reduced. So a ring is called reduced. reduced if it has no no potent elements. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this is this is reduced. Okay. So um, uh, yeah, so that that's that's uh, that's all I have to say. So this is a red is this reduced thing. Okay, any questions on that before I move on in the, the last bit of time to do module stuff? Hopefully that kind of clarifies a little bit about, the radical is awesome. The radical is a really cool trick. Like the, the radical of an ideal, right, is just kind of like, it gets rid of a lot of crap, right, that, that's in the ideal. Uh, I mean, by making it larger, right? But it makes it so that it, it behaves a bit better, right? Um, and that's that's kind of the idea. That's why we care about the radical of the ideal. Okay. Um, all right. So now I'm going to move on if, since there are no questions. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Okay. So we're going to start moving.